The word repentance means to change directions, to turn around, to correct a negative behavior. And we all got some of that stuff in our lives that we need to repent from. But it's hard to get motivated into repentance. So God will use things occasionally like trouble. Oh, trouble will make you repent. You've been doing something you shouldn't have been doing. And then as a result of doing what you knew you shouldn't do, all hell breaks loose. And oh, we'll repent quick. Because we knew in the first place and, and that, that motivates our repentance. And something else that can motivate repentance is heavy conviction. You know, just a heaviness come on you and you realize I shouldn't be doing this. This isn't me. I shouldn't be putting myself in this position. And that heaviness, it just sits in your soul until you turn around and you repent. Another thing that can motivate repentance is godly discipline. The scripture says whom the Lord loves, he chastens that occasionally daddy will take off his belt and give us a whipping, not because he hates us, but because he loves us and he will discipline us into repentance. But this text reveals that there's a fourth way God leads us into repentance. That sometimes God motivates our repentance by just being so good to us. That you are going on, living your life, doing your own thing, going your own way. And God blessed you so good that the blessing was so intense. You said, I can't keep going this way. Look at how good he's been to me. Look at how much he's blessed me. Look at how he keeps opening up doors for me and making ways for me. Look at this large blessing. He just dumped on my life and the goodness of the Lord will turn you around. The Romans chapter two, verse four says this. It says that the goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. Say that with me. The goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. You see that, that last line, the goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. And that's what the first part of our text in John 21 is all about. Now, as I told you before, the text is separated in two categories. It starts with the blessing and then it goes to the repentance. Today, let's put our magnifying glass on the blessing. Look at John 21 verse one. I got a little bit of a low end ring up here, brother, if you could help me out with it. John 21 verse one. The text says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, after these things, after what things? This text is given after the crucifixion of Jesus. It's given after Judas had betrayed him. It's given after Peter had denied him. It's given after Jesus had gone to the whipping post and suffered 39 stripes that literally tore his body apart. It's given after they hung his mangled body up on the cross. It's given after they pulled him down and buried him in a borrowed tomb. It's giving after that he laid in the ground for three days and all hope seemed to be lost. And it's given after he got back up again. So when you see after these things, the scripture is summarizing all of the hell, pain, torture, and difficulty he went through and then lets you know there was an after these things. And if you're careful, you can hear the scripture prophetically screaming to you with those first three words, after these things. The scripture is telling followers of Jesus that yes, there will be times of crucifixion. Yes, there will be crosses to bear. Jesus said, if any man be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Yes, there will be seasons of persecution. 
Yes, you will have a Judas in your life, someplace at some time, who comes into your circle just to get information so that they can betray you and sell you out. And yes, you will have a Peter in your life, the closest thing to you, who you were supposed to be able to lean on, that denies that they ever knew you and walks away. Yes, you will have times where you feel buried by your circumstances. You feel like there's no hope that you can ever get up again. But for every one of those situations, every believer is also promised a resurrection, a comeback, a divine get up. And they're promised that there will be an after these things. Now, I don't know what things you're going through this morning. Maybe financial things, maybe family things, maybe health things, maybe things in your mind that are so complicated that you can't even talk about. But some of you have been feeling the walls closing in and you feel like this may be the thing. This set of issues, these set of things may be the thing that pulls you under and that holds you down. But to those of you who that situation lines up with what you're going through, I want you to read those words again. After these things, the Lord told me to tell you, first of all, there will be an after this. I don't know what your this is. I don't know where you're being fought. I don't know where the trouble is manifesting it in self in your life, but there will be an after this. I want to tell every section because I don't know where you're sitting, but I came for you, this part of the service, whoever you are, there will be an after this. It says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again. I like that. After these things, Jesus showed himself again. He has a habit of doing that. And it encourages believers that if God has ever showed up for you once, I don't know where my people are that have some experience with him, but, but he's, if he's ever showed up for you once, the scripture says, he that began a good thing in you will continue it. He'll keep doing it. He'll keep coming back to it. He'll do it again. And if God ever moved once in your finances, you have a guarantee. If he does it once, it's a guarantee he's going to show up and do it Again, if he ever healed you once, you have a guarantee. If he ever did it once, he will do it again. If he ever pulled you out of trouble and delivered you once, there is a guarantee that what he does once, he will do. That encourages me because I don't know about you. I'm thankful for all of the miracles last year. But this morning, God, I need you to do it. Again, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. And in this way, he showed himself. How is he going to show himself? He's going to show himself in this way. And look at what he did. Verse 2, Simon Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel and the sons of Zebedee and two others, they were together. Everybody say together. together. Now, the disciples have been through hell. They buried Jesus, and along with Jesus, they buried their hopes and expectations. What they wanted Jesus to do was to set up an earthly kingdom to remove Israel from the domineering clutches of the Roman Empire. They felt like Jesus could use his power, his miracles, his fame, and his influence to make Israel a sovereign state again and ward off the invading armies of Rome. But when Jesus died, their hope of an earthly kingdom died with them. Furthermore, because of their close proximity and relationship to Jesus, the disciples also became enemies of the court. They themselves were on the run. They were living up under a threat. They were hiding out. They were depressed. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. But they were together. They were together. And it brings up and exaggerates the point that if you have to go through hard times, it's best to go through hard times together with people of faith. However, the enemy will tempt you 
to isolate yourself when you go through trouble. But isolation fixes nothing. When trouble comes, it's time to gather together, to huddle up, to find your tribe, to try to find your group, to, to get through it with somebody else who has faith the way you have faith. The scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you see that evil day approaching. In other words, the more evil the day gets, the more you ought to get together with people of faith. Because sometimes encouragement doesn't flow from God straight to you. Sometimes God will put your encouragement in somebody else's laugh or your encouragement in somebody else's hug or handshake, your encouragement in somebody else's mouth. And, and when you gather together, a strength flows that can't flow any other way other than gathering together. And a side note, when you gather together, it breaks selfishness. And the tendency to throw a pity party and get into uh, 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 self-pity and shame. Because when you gather together with other people, you realize no matter how bad you're hurting, you're not the only one. Oh, I just said it there right there. No matter how bad it's going in your life, somebody else has been through or is going through what you're going through right now. So it removes the enemy's lie in your ear that you're the only one that's got it so bad. You're the only one that ever lost a man. You're the only one that ever got a divorce. You're the only one that ever got their car repossessed. You're the only one that lights ever got turned out. You're the only one that ever lost their job. All the people in the world are successful and have plenty of money and have great jobs. And you are the only one. And that sounds crazy. But when you stay isolated, the enemy will constantly barrage your mind to try to convince you. You are the only one. You're the only one that's being talked about. All the people at the office, nobody has negative opinions about them. You're the the only one everybody don't like to see coming and you build yourself a little altar and you make yourself an idol when you do that and the true root cause of that is selfishness and pride but when you gather with other people you find out that God's not just been sustaining you and keeping you alive through your trouble but he's been sustaining a whole lot of other people and if God could get them through it But see, if you don't get together, you don't know that. Pastor, you just have no idea how much financial trouble I'm in. How many people that God's got you out of some financial trouble, raise your hand. I mean bad financial trouble. I mean you didn't know where the next resource was coming from, but supernaturally, somehow, some way, at the last minute, God stepped in and blessed you financially. Where are you in the house? Pastor, I'm just struggling with my health. Ain't nobody ever gone through something like what I got. How many people God sustained you through a health crisis? Healed your body. Raised you up. Gave the doctors the wisdom. Or sent the right flow or the right healing or the right medication at the right time. How many people God blessed you and healed you in your body? Pastor, you just, you just have no idea how bad my marriage is. I ain't going to ask you to raise your hand about your marriage. You just, we'll just keep that part private. But, but did you really think you were the only one? Yeah. You know why? Because in isolation, that's the... That's the track that keeps playing on repeat. Only you. All about you. But when you gather together, it breaks that. So they were all together. Everybody say together. I'm going to give a, a, a little blurb here about church attendance. It ain't always easy to come to church on Sunday. But no matter what, you ought to make the sacrifice to do it. 
because something happens when you come into this room and we're together and you're missing something when you're not here and we're missing something when you're not here. It's important that we come. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to him, I'm going fishing. And uh, they said to him, well, uh, we're going with you. And they immediately got into the boat. And that night, they caught nothing. It's like that sometimes when you're living by faith. They're already down and depressed. Jesus is dead. They needed something to lift their spirit. They needed something to work. Have you ever had so many things broken in your life that you just needed one thing? I just need one thing. Just one thing to work. So Peter goes back to the one thing that he knows he can do. Fishing. And they said, Lord, if you're going fishing, we'll go with you. We just want to watch you fish. We just want to watch you make something work. And they get out there and they're fishing. And then the night goes by and they caught nothing. There's nothing like the feeling of casting out a net with expectation and then reeling it back in. Nothing. And then casting it out again. Reeling it back in. I'm going to get something this time. Nothing. And then casting it again and again and again. All night long. And bringing back in. Nothing. Have you ever had to do a whole lot of working? Just to receive a whole lot of nothing? There ain't. Nothing like sweating and laboring and throwing that sucker out into the water and pulling with all your might and pulling up nothing. But it's how you deal with your nothing days. Let me make up a word. It's how you deal with your nothingness. Ooh, I like that. It's how you deal with your nothingness that determines your capacity to be blessed. What do you do when you pray and you get back nothing? And you sow seed into the kingdom and you get back nothing. And you serve and you work and you get back nothing. What do you do when you're fishing and you're not catching? You keep fishing. I said you keep fishing. I said you keep fishing. You keep fishing. Notice the disciples. Next verse. They, fit, they were fishing all night and they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, notice this. If the disciples would have quit fishing before the morning, they would have missed the miracle catch that was coming. They had to keep pulling in nothing all night in order to survive the night and get to the morning where Jesus was standing on the shore. And I don't know who this is for, but some of you have been in a night season of nothingness, a night season of working real hard and pulling back nothing. But I want to tell you that the night is giving way to the dawning of a brand new day in Christ. And what you do in the morning will overwhelm all of the losses that you have had in the night because Jesus is on the shore and when you survive the weeping that endures through the night you are positioned to be a recipient of the joy that comes in the morning if you refuse to quit in the night help me encourage your neighbor tell him don't quit in the night don't don't quit in the night don't quit in the night verse 5 Jesus said to them this is so funny children have you any food? And what's bad about that verse is Jesus is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He knows they ain't caught no fish. <laughs> Woo, God. Got any food? No. Next verse. He says, uh, cast the net on the right side of the boat. 
and you'll find some. Maybes. Yeah, maybe here. So you're telling me I've been throwing my net all night over here. But if I magically just take it six feet in the other direction, I'm going to get in what one cast what I couldn't get all night. I mean, how wide could the boat have been? What difference does it make what side we cast the net on? all the difference in the world because you don't get a miracle just because you want one where you cast your net of expectation is everything to do with what flows in your life and before they were casting based off of human effort and intuition but now that he has spoken his word to them, now they're not casting based off human effort or intuition. Now they are casting based off of faith. Right? So he said, cast based off of my word. Cast based off of my instruction. Cast based off what I'm leading you to do. Cast that thing on the other side. Now, why do I say they were casting by faith? Because faith comes by hearing, but hearing only comes by the word of Jesus. So all night long, they were casting with no faith. They get one word from Jesus. Here's the faith. So the scripture says, so they cast. And now, I just feel that so prophetically for somebody. You've been trying something that's not been working. Listen, don't clap. You've been trying something that's not been working. And the enemy and people, I don't know which one louder, has been telling you you need to try something different. In the text, the disciples didn't do anything different. They just lined up the same effort with the word that Jesus had spoken. They lined up their functional effort with the power of forceful faith. I don't know who this is for. You're going to do the same thing you've been doing. But the next time you do it, it's going to yield a supernatural result. You don't have to move cities. You don't have to move states. You don't have to do anything radically different or change where you are. The next time you do what you normally naturally do it's going to yield super natural results so they cast they didn't change the boat they didn't change the net they didn't change the people that were throwing it out they didn't change the 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 wrist movement with which they threw the net they didn't change strategies they did the same thing just lined up with one word from Jesus. And their natural abilities yielded supernatural results. I pray that over your life this morning, Christian world, that your natural abilities will yield supernatural results. If you receive it, give God a praise all over the house. Now, every blessing, people don't like this, but let me help you. Every blessing comes with a burden. Well, that's not a promise box scripture right there. That's not a great quote to put on your refrigerator. Every blessing comes with a burden. So the question is, can you stand to be blessed? Can you handle being blessed? Do you have the flexibility and the maneuverability to manage a super catch when it comes? They, they throw their net out and, uh, and they throw it on the right side. Well, let's try this thing. They just throw it and, and then they go to bring it up.
and there's so much blessing in it, the vehicle with which they used to get out into the water was too small to manage the haul that they had received. In other words, the system they were operating with was too small to deal with what God just dumped on them. So they're out in the middle of the water with a supernatural catch, but they don't have the ability to reel it in because the blessing is stronger than their strength to pull it, and it's bigger than the capacity of the boat to tow it. What would you do with a blessing you didn't have room enough. So they scream out to the shore, to their partners, to their buddies, to their friends. And they said, bring boats. Bring boats. You're going to have to help me gather this in. Some of you are about to have to say that concerning your business. You're going to have to start calling people and say, can I hire you? I need your boat. I need your hands. I need your legs. I need your mind. I need your ability because I got more than I can drag to the shore. Can, can, can I give your cousin a job? Is anybody in your family looking for a job? Because I got so much coming in. I'm having trouble hauling it to the shore. God can put one thing on your life, one word on your life, one idea in your mind, one one thing in your head, one anointing on you that causes more to come in than you currently have the ability or capacity to manage by yourself. And that's when you know it's God. Because when God blesses, it's not just for you. When God blesses, it's for you to be a blessing to other people and get other people involved in the supernatural catch that God just dumped on your life. What if the blessing that's coming was so big you had to get partners? Hey, real quick, I ain't talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to you. What if the blessing that was about to hit your life was so big you had to go out and get partners? What if you had to change your system? What if you had to tweak your style of living and style of management? What if you had to tweak your time management? What if you had to go through your life and redo everything just to accommodate the catch? It's coming. That's what happened to Thomas. He just stood up here and testified. Now, historians say this net had one year salary in it. One year salary in one day. Well, that's what happened when they doubled his salary. He got one year's salary in one day. If God could do it for Thomas, oh, where's the faith people let? I said, if God could do it for the man I just stood up in front of you, where's the believing people at? Where's the declaring people at? Where's the power people at that say, God, you can bless me. All last night, I've had nothing. I've been laboring. Ain't got nowhere. I've been sweating. Ain't made no progress. But I believe it's your word that I can have one catch. So their friends have to help them get to the shore. Verse 9 says, as soon as they had come to land, Look at this text, folks. Soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it. In other words, Jesus already had the thing. They were fishing for. See, when you seek Jesus, you get more than him. Oh, let's say that again. I said, when you seek Jesus, you get more than him. You remember that promise, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. When you seek Jesus, you get more than him. But the funny thing about these fish is, uh, is these fish are on the fire. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus has done. He's blessed Peter's fishing business financially. By giving him a year's worth catch in one day. 
But he also knows the disciples are hungry. Because when you fish all night and you've caught nothing and then you strain to reel in the biggest catch you've ever had, you work up an appetite. So Jesus not only gives them the fish in the ocean, he gives them the fish on the land. When they get to the shore, they see fish that they didn't catch, that they didn't clean that they didn't cook. It was a prepared blessing. Not only, not only are you going to get a super catch. Ooh, I feel that. A super catch. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm preaching to somebody. You're going to get a super catch. A super catch. I'm speaking over your resources right now. A super catch. I don't know if you got the faith to reel in what I'm throwing out, but you will get a super catch. It's going to do more than you think it's going to do. It's going to yield more than you think it's going to yield. It's going to have more come in it than you're expecting to come in it. It's going to be a super catch, supernaturally given by the grace, favor, and kindness of God. It's going to be a super catch. But not only that, he's going to minister to your personal needs. To your personal needs, to the hunger of your soul, to the hunger of your emotions, to the places on the inside where you've been running on empty, he's already got a prepared blessing. The Lord told me to tell you, Jesus still knows where you're hungry. Some of you are hungry for love. Nobody sees it. You never talk about it. And it's not as simple as getting married. There's some married people that are hungry for love. Getting married doesn't necessarily mean you're overflowing with love. Some of you are hungry for energy. Seems like every day you are more drained than the last. Sleeping but not resting. Fatigued in your mind, your body, your soul. Jesus knows where you're hungry. Some of you is for community, is for connection, or it's for purpose. You don't want to feel like you're living out your days without reason. Jesus knows where you're hungry. And it's not just about the resources all the time. Sometimes it's about the hunger of the soul. What's missing on the inside, that lacking piece, that piece that's been held back. He knows where you're hungry, and he's got fish on the fire. Next verse. Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Next verse. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full, full of a large fish. Can I just give that to you? Large blessing. I just speak it over your life. Large blessing. I speak it over your business. Large blessing. Wherever you work, I speak it over your vocation, over your position at work, over what you do at work. Large blessing. May you rise all the way to the top in your company. May the people that work with you have to stand back and say, there's something special about this one. Large blessing. Say it with me. Large blessing. Say, Lord, I receive large blessing. I felt something when you said that. I don't know if you felt it. Let's try it again. Say, Lord, Lord, I receive receive large blessing. I like what Larry's doing right now. He's got his hands out like this. Let's try that together. See if you don't feel different. Lord, Lord, I I receive large blessing. Stay right there for a minute. Stay right there for I feel something coming down. I don't know if you can feel it. Lord, I receive large blessing. I just receive large. Now just keep your hands like that just a moment. Close your eyes. Lift up your hands to the Father. 
Lord, we receive large blessings. Yeah. 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 Pour it on their gifts. Pour it on their energy. Pour it on the work of their hands. Pour it on their abilities. Pour it on their strength. Lord, I receive large blessings. Jesus. Amen. 153. 153. 153. Yeah. 153. Somebody this yearly salary is in the high 70s. Before September of 2020, you're going to make be making 153,000. Listen. Listen. That was one of those words of prophecy that just came to me. I don't know where you are. I'm not going to ask you if you make in the 70s. I'm not going to raise you. You remember the Sunday I spoke it before September of 2020. In a little more than a year's time, you'd be making $153,000, says the word of the Lord. 153. And although, look at this, look at this. Although there were so many, the net was not broken. Listen, some of you have had, not everybody, but, but somebody, some of you have had some windfall blessings in your life. We got a big check or a big opportunity or, or a lot came in at once. But it's been like every time something big happens and you catch something big, you got a broken spot in the net and it just seems like it just drains all the way back out. You got a big job, you got a big commission on it, you made a big sale, you get a big opportunity, but, but there's a break in the net, and it seems like you get something big, and you make a lot, and then you lose a lot. Or you get your paycheck, and you've already paid all the bills for the month, and you get your paycheck, and you're so excited, and then you hit a pothole, and two of your tires go out. Or you get home and it's mid-June and your AC ain't working. And all of a sudden, yeah, you had a, you had a chunk, right? But, but there's a hole in the net. In this season, a blessing's coming. And God won't let the net. I release the blessing of unbreakable nets. Ooh, I feel that thing. You feel that word? I release Joshua, it's all over you, brother. I release the blessing of unbreakable nets. Chase, I release the blessing of unbreakable nets. The blessing of unbreakable nets. Say that, say, I receive, I receive. the blessing, the blessing. Of, unbreakable of unbreakable nets. Next verse, 12. Verse 12. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Now listen, at this time, Jesus in his glorified body, he's faintly recognizable to what he was as a man, but not totally. You remember the disciples on the road to Emmaus? They were Jesus' disciples, but they didn't recognize him after the resurrection. Same kind of thing here. He was faintly recognizable, not totally and they weren't totally sure who he was, but they didn't dare ask him because they knew it was him. How did they know? They looked at the blessing and they said, that blessing right there, that blessing right there, that can only come from the Lord. And some of you have been distant from God. You've not been where you were supposed to be. You've been not You've been not doing things on the inside that you know you're supposed to do, and you may not recognize his presence like you used to. You may not recognize his face in worship like you used to, but a blessing is coming to your life that when you see that blessing, you look back and say, I know that. I'm familiar with that. I understand that something like that could only come. 
Stand to your feet and give God worship and adoration in the house. Come on, give him worship and adoration in the house. Come on, open up your mouth and bless him. Come on, open up your mouth and praise him. Now, I want you to consider this. This was Peter's boat. Everybody say Peter's boat. Peter's boat. It was Peter's net. It was Peter's fishing trip. Other disciples, they just went. You understand? The last interaction Peter has had with Jesus, Peter is cursing his name and swearing that he doesn't know him. He's not my God. I don't know him. What are you talking about? I've never seen him before in my life. Now, Jesus has come to the shore to restore Peter and lead him into repentance and put him back on the right path because you cannot deny the Lord and be saved. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, my father will deny you in heaven. So Peter has got to repent. He's got to turn. Something's got to change. So Jesus starts the change. Not by going up to Peter in his resurrected state, putting his holy finger in his face and saying, bow down and ask for forgiveness. You were wrong. You were a liar. I warned you not to do it. I warned you you were going to deny me and you did it anyway. No, he doesn't do that. Jesus will confront him next week in the text. But before he does, he just releases a windfall. A large blessing. Proving and showing and revealing that many times it's the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the blessing of God that'll see you on the wrong road and stop you and get your attention with a large blessing. And when you look at the blessing, all of a sudden you start crying. When you look at the blessing, all of a sudden you start repenting. When you look at the blessing, all of a sudden you say, I got to go back and I got to turn my life around. I got to go another way because he's been so good to me. It's a good, large blessing that was the first step in Peter's repentance. And also I want to tell you. If there was ever a text that proves God's not mad at you. If there was ever a text that proves God's happy to see you. It's this one. Now, I'm hard on my boy, on Levi. I ain't hard on Sam yet. He's too young, but he's gonna, it's going to come a day. <laughs> I'm hard on Levi because... He's got some things he's overcoming, and life's not going to cut him any slack. That's good, sir. And people that don't have his blood aren't going to cut him any slack. That's good, sir. So if I'm not hard on him, I'm doing him a disservice. So I'm hard on him. He knows it. And uh, he had been misbehaving and not listening to his mama. And, and I was out, and I, I came home, and she told him, she said, when daddy gets home, I'm going to tell him that you've been misbehaving. But here's the problem. I've been out of town for 10 days, and I missed that little sucker. So even though it's my nature to be hard on him, and even though he was misbehaving, and normally, oh, mm. but I walked in, and I was so glad to see him. And he came up to me crying, because he knows, you know. Daddy, I, I wasn't listening. And, and and I shocked him. I pulled out a cake pop from Starbucks. I picked up.
picked him up and gave him a big kiss and told him that I loved him. Took him up, got in bed with him, told him a bedtime story. I shocked him. And some of you, there's some stuff that's not right. You know it. But you're coming to God like my little boy was coming to me. You're coming to God crying because it's ever before you in your mind where you're wrong and where you're insufficient. But you have no idea how much he's missed you since you've been gone. You have no idea how much he loves you and how glad he is to see you. You have no comprehension of the depth of his love and value for you. He loved you so much he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. He loved you so much he sent part of himself, his Holy Spirit, to abide in the earth, to do nothing but hold back the enemy and draw people into salvation, draw people to come back home. And sometimes to turn you around, sometimes to fix your toxic negative behavior, sometimes he'll just shock you with goodness, shock you with mercy, shock you with blessing, just shock you with love. And I speak that over your life. I speak this text over your life. I preached it line by line, verse by verse, so you'd get it deep in your spirit. I speak that large blessing over your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, I speak that you would know your Father's happy to see you. I speak that you would know God only wants your good. God only wants your beauty and your development and your strength. God only wants the best for you. He's not angry with you. He wants the best for you. Even when he disciplines, he wants the best for you. Even when things are hard, he wants the best. And I speak that. I speak that. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. There's about 14 people in here that need a hug real bad, so help me do it. Just hug your neighbor. Two or three people on either side. Just hug somebody. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. everybody not for everybody okay there's people who need to let your net down okay you need to let your net down 
Right now, we're going to receive an offering for the kingdom of God, and I'm going to tell you where it's going to go. We've been building a wall out front. I don't know if y'all have seen it, stretching across our property. We're securing our grounds, making this temple safe. We have so many events here where we have children on the grounds, and we bring bounce houses, and we cook for the community and everything, and we want to make sure we do it in an environment that we can control that's safe, and you can't do that without what we're doing, and each one of those wall sections that are out there, it's got concrete, it's got rock pillars, it's got wood, it's got labor involved in it. Each one of those 50-foot sections cost this church $3,000. And we hadn't said anything to you up until this point, but we got five more sections we've got to do. And I want to give you an opportunity to join with me and sow into that. They're $3,000 per section. And I believe there's at least 10 people here, possibly more, but there's at least 10 people who could join together with a $300 seed and knock out one of these sections. I believe it. I believe it. I believe there's 10 people that could give $300 and help us knock another section out. So I'm, I'm gonna take some of these envelopes and I'll have another challenge for, for you in a moment. But there's 10 of you. And the Holy Spirit told me to challenge you and that he would speak to your heart. So if you're in this place and, you know, if you want to give 150 of it today and just pledge the rest by the end of the month, that's fine too. But if you want to let down your net into the kingdom of God, and that's what you're doing when you give your seed, when you give sacrificially, you're casting out a net based on the word of Jesus, based on the scripture we taught. You're casting out a net, and I believe there's a super catch for you. I believe there's a super catch for you. If, if you're one of those that can join Katie and I, we're the first. You can do either 150 today and the rest by the end of the month, or you can do the whole 300. Come get one of these envelopes. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, my friend. God bless you, my friend. Lord bless you, brother. Lord bless you, Larry. Lord bless you, Jeff. Lord bless you, Thomas. Lord bless you, Carlise. Lord bless you, my sister. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. Lord bless you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, sister. Now, if you're in the room and you say, Pastor, I feel you on that. I want to let my net down. I can't give on that level. But I will give the very best that I can today. Come get one of these. Come get one of these. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. You are near, always near to the broken hearted. You are faithful and true. Oh, you are good, always good. I'm standing on your promise. I will wait, I will wait Come on, sing that again. You are near, always be to the broken God bless you. Hearted. You are faithful, you are faithful and, true. and true. Oh, you are good, always good. I'm standing on your promise. I will filling out a pledge just just put the amount you're giving today and the amount you're pledging and I speak the blessing of God upon you and I speak you reel in a super catch in the name of Jesus 
if you had a heart to give but you weren't able to, I pray God shocks you this week with blessing, overwhelms your life with favor and prosperity, and strengthens the work of your hands, and makes you a blessing in your family, in your community, and all around you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand to your feet all over the house. Stand to your feet all over the house. When you have your offering prepared, you can come and bring it. I want to say as we close today that our Heavenly Father, our God, has graced us, I believe, more than any church in the city by giving us the apostolic headship gift of our Father, Bishop Michael Sides. And I am so unbelievably proud to be his son. And I'm so unbelievably proud that my two sons are his grandkids. And I'm so unbelievably proud that we're standing in the middle of a vision that God put in his spirit all those years ago. And I want to encourage you I want to encourage you, when these days of honor come around, make sure whether you send a text or put something on Facebook, make sure you give honor where honors do. We got the best bishop in the whole wide world. Listen, the first part of John 21 is great, but the next part whoo, is amazing. Do yourself a favor and me one too. Don't miss next week, okay? It's going to be awesome. God's not mad at you. God loves you. God draws you today back to him. God draws you today back to prayer. God offers you cleansing from your sins by the shed blood of Jesus. God offers you strength for your life and security for your final resting place in eternity. It's all in your faith in Jesus. So everybody say, I believe in Jesus. And Jesus is Lord. I confess him as Savior. I receive him in my life. In Jesus' name. God bless you. If you haven't already brought your offering, bring it. We love you so much. You're dismissed. Don't miss part two next week.